Uh, hi, Professor. Hey, Brandon. Yeah, uh, uh, are you recording this? Um, yeah, I am. Okay, so okay? after the, the, when you're done, you should put a copy on the, uh, you know, the lab YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And make sure you turn off the recording at the end. So, uh, okay. you know, so that we don't record the faculty deliberation. Okay. okay. Who are the uh, uh, faculty? Uh, Professor Xiao Long and Peng Tao. Okay. No, I thought you were going to have like Nikolai or something like that. Um, I'm more familiar with those two faculty, so okay. yeah, and he seems really busy, so yeah. That's fine. Okay. Uh, hi, Professor Xiaolong. I think uh, we're just waiting for uh, Professor Peng Tao, and then we can. How many people? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I invited a lot of people, a lot of like uh, collaborators and other friends. Hi, Xiaolong. Hi. I guess we're waiting for Pinko. Oh, no. uh, yeah, I think he's here. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. Give me a sec. Uh, can you guys see the slides? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, seems like we have uh, 17 people here right now. So um, thank you to uh, my friends, lab mates, and collaborators, as well as uh, the committee today, Professor Nuno, Professor Xiaolong, and Professor Peng Tao. So today I'm going to be talking about a research project that I've been working on since I was a sophomore in undergrad, so way back in 2017. So it's a project that I've been working on for quite a while. Um, the title is Understanding Learned Visual Invariances Through Hierarchical Dataset Design and Collection. So it's quite a long title, but hopefully by the end of today's talk, um, you'll gain a bit more intuition and insight into um, this area of research. And yeah, I'm happy to share my work. So first, I want to talk about um, what I really mean by uh, invariance in vision. So this applies to both human vision as well as computer vision. Um, so for example, here are two pictures of cars. And um, you know, as humans, we can easily identify them. Um, but in addition, we can also sort of generalize um, the visual uh, appearance generalize the notion of a car to different visual appearances while still keeping the core semantic concepts of what a car is. 
So for example, um, with a car in different um, settings, so for example, at night, in the rain or in the snow, um, we still understand what the visual essence of a car is. And um, this can actually be generalized even further. For example, you can have like an exotic car like flipped upside down. You can have sketches of a car. You can have a car like submerged underwater. Like in all these cases, um, if you show even a child like a picture of a car, they can probably generalize and understand that these all depict cars in different forms. So to give some background context um, for invariance for uh, computer vision in particular, um, so there are previous like older, more classical handcrafted approaches like corner detectors or, and SIFT. And um, these older approaches did allow for some low level geometric invariance. So by, uh, uh, by looking for corners and things like that, you do have some like rotation invariance and affine transformation invariance, but this was all um, sort of not very sophisticated. Um, these days, modern CNNs are data-driven and can learn more abstract notions of um, concepts and invariances. So um, uh, in general, um, these are statist statistical models whose parameters are uh, learned through a large data set, and they optimize some defined objective like um, car classification. Um, there are some like built-in architectural priors that help with this. For example, like downsampling is part of these models. And that helps to provide some scale invariance. And also, like the convolutional filters slide across the image to help provide translation invariance uh, in the images. Um, and there's some also some other techniques like data augmentation. But the main idea is um, through a large data set, the neural network learns to map all these different concepts and pictures of cars into one output. And indeed, over the past decade, these CNNs have enabled um, a considerable uh, amount of progress towards this. And this is the case for many different tasks, like classification, detection, and so on, and under many settings in terms of the amount of um, ground truth labels that you have for your data. And this is also attributed to some other factors like uh, better hardware and um, bigger data sets that are scraped online. So for example, um, for prominent uh, like data set that's scripted online called ImageNet. Um, in 2011, like handcrafted approaches got around like 50% accuracy, but in the past decade, decade, CNNs have led to like almost 90% accuracy on this once um, formally thought to be like a pretty challenging data set. So um, this progress has led to some like news outlets to say that like machine vision, vision is on track to surpass human sight. And, um, you know, the question is, why don't we have self-driving cars yet, if that's the case? And um, so, like, so what's going on here? Is it just all hype? Um, like, what's really going on in the research? So just as an example, I actually took those car images that I showed you earlier, and I actually fed them um, to a pre-trained efficient net, which is one of, like, the state-of-the-art approaches now. And for those, um, like basic car examples, it did predict it um, correctly. For example, it predicted that this was a station rag wagon car. Um, but for these more challenging examples of cars in different um, scenarios, like um, like in the dark or in the rain, um, it sort of uh, predicted that this was a traffic light, even though there's no traffic light in this picture. And um, and the same is for these uh, more challenging examples. Like it thought that there was a submarine in this image. Uh, I thought that the cyber truck was a golf cart and so on. So, um, so clearly 90% accuracy on ImageNet doesn't mean that like computer vision uh, classification is a solved problem. And in particular, the significant challenges come from the fact that, yes, it's true that if you do have all the data um, and your testing distribution is the same as your training data distribution, then yeah, you might be fine. But um, in real world cases, this is um, not what happens, and CNNs actually have a difficulty to generalize across these domains. So what I mean is, it's easy to scrape images like this um, online and get even like millions of images like this of cars, but um, these types of images are rare or absent in that data set. So um, it's hard for neural networks to generalize from these notions of cars to, um, to this. 
Additionally, there is something called adversarial attacks, which is basically um, there are ways to like uh, engineer certain noise patterns where when you add it to the image, it causes the image to be classified incorrectly. And the thing is, um, the test set alone cannot test for this invariance because um, so you, you normally have a you partition your data set into images that you train on and then images that you test on and these are disjoint. But both of these are drawn from the same underlying distribution of image uh, of image script online. So even if you have issues like this, you can't easily test for them, making them uh, blind spots. So the key takeaway here is that basically data driven CNNs are like a double edged sword. So in many cases, you have drastically improved performance, especially compared to the handcrafted approaches. But they can be unstable and unintuitive because um, there are essentially millions of parameters that are approximately optimized to gradient descent. And it's also subject to data set bias because they are so data driven. So things like viewpoint and uh, different lighting and pictures and different camera quality, et cetera. So um, as a concrete example, um, a few years ago, I actually took a bunch of like so if you notice, if you Google docs, like most of them depict docs from the front, or here we have like one from the side. Um, so from this observation, I actually um, gave a lot of annotators all the doc images from ImageNet, and I had them classify the viewpoint of the docs. And it turns out that only 3% of those images uh, depict docs from the back. And it's similarly skewed for a different data set called uh, Microsoft Coco. So um, the main hypothesis of the talk today is that um, a data set collected with controlled hierarchical levels of variability instead of like randomly scraping online or something like that would effectively reveal these um, blind spots in current methods when it comes to generalizability. And so in this uh, thesis defense today, I'm going to be discussing a new data set um, that we collected to satisfy this criteria. Um, I'm going to talk about some experimental results that sort of measure the blind spots um, for invariance, and also I'm discussing the, some uh, novel methods that I've proposed in my research to help improve uh, generalizability. So the first question is, like, can we just curate a web scraped online image data set as like a benchmark to test for um, like generalizability? So it's understood that, yeah, for training, we need millions of images or something like that. So we can't really like curate something like that. But can we just have a benchmark where a bit more effort is taken to look for images online that are like kind of these edge cases? And you might end up with something like this. So this is for trains, but you might end up with like photos of trains in the real world, uh, different like clip art versions of trains, toy trains and things like that. And then you can use this as a smaller like test set benchmark to test if um, your neural network can generalize to like clip art representations of trains um, and uh, things like that. So the advantage here is that this is simple and cost effective. Um, you just need to look for images online and you can get a, a rather diverse set of images. Unfortunately here, um, individual objects are scattered and seen inconsistently. So for example, um, this red train here, there's no other represent, representation of that red train in this whole data set. So you don't have any other viewpoints of this red train, nor do you have like representations of a clip art version of that uh, red train itself or like a toy model of it, most likely. So that leads to some um, measurement ambiguity. It's also subject to uneven viewpoint coverage. Um, so like I said, you there, it's hard to find another image of this exact red train in a different uh, viewpoint, like from the side, for example. Um, it's also only in 2D, so you only have 2D images. And you may also have some within domain inconsistency or variance. So for example, for toy trains, some pictures might have backgrounds, some might have blank backgrounds, you might have different lighting conditions within a single domain or category here. Um, so that leads to difficulty in measuring these things rigorously. So the question is, um, if we can't do web scraped online, like data curation, uh, if we have these issues, can we do real world data collection? Can we have uh, individual objects that are seen throughout all these different categories or domains? 
Uh, can we have even viewpoint coverage? Can we maybe even get some 3D information? And can we make um, the domains themselves be more consistent and have less variance? Um, so as you imagine, that's sort of exactly what uh, was done. And the data set is called the 3D Object Domain Dataset Suite, or 3D Odds. So um, this is a carefully designed and hierarchical real-world data set with around 200K images and um, over 300 3D meshes. And there are three disentangled variation factors. So there's um, domain viewpoint in class. So in this case, for this data set, uh, one domain is we imaged a lot of different objects in like a turntable setting. And then we also imaged those same objects using a drone. And finally, we took those images outdoors and um, to different indoor locations around the UC San Diego campus. And we took pictures of them with smartphones. So in all these cases, we have multi-view images. And we also did this for objects of um, many different classes. So things like um, trains, uh, boats, airplanes, and clocks, and so on. So even with this size, um, like modern methods require like millions of images. So, th so it's due to the size, um, it's more ideal as a benchmark or testing framework. Or it can be used for settings where you have um, a fewer amount of data, like few shot learning. And this is an example of one object from this data set. So as you can see, this is the um, category or domain for um, the images taken with the drone. Um, we took the same train outdoors and took images of them outdoors. And uh, these are images of the train that we took um, using the turntable setup. And then uh, we, we also reconstructed a mesh version of this train. So here are some additional examples. These are four different um, airplanes from the data set. And um, we also have other classes, so things like telephones, uh, hats, uh, mice, and um, trains. And all these classes were designed to have overlap. So they're also seen in other prominent data sets, like ImageNet and ShapeNet. So um, now I'm going to go into a bit more detail about these three domains. So first is um, O turntable. So this is collected in the lab using a turntable and DSLR camera setup. So um, we use the blank background and professional grade lighting to take pictures of these objects in the turntable. And we collected a lot of different images. And then we use these images to reconstruct a 3D mesh using um, standard structure, uh, structure from motion software. So next, um, the other domain is OWL. So this stands for um, objects obtained with flight. Um, and in this case, we used a automated flying drone. So um, I helped develop a scalable and easily re reproducible drone flight algorithm that uses um, like some classical machine vision techniques and like PID flight controls. Uh, here it follows like a pattern on the floor and tries to like um, circle around the object in the middle by itself. And um, as you can see, it has a green screen background. And because it's using a drone, there are some special unique characteristics of the images obtained from this data. So first, um, it uses the drone on board camera. So it's kind of uh, like lower quality. And there's also some um, camera jitter and motion blur due to the drone flight. Um, so for example, here each row is um, one viewpoint of this uh, object, uh, but there are different images taken as the drone hovers at that uh, one viewpoint. So I've enlarged some images here, but we can see that um, even though it's at the same viewpoint, there are some slight variations due to the drone flight as it hovers and takes those images. And finally, um, the O wild domain is we took these objects out in the wild and imaged them. So these were collected around the uh, UC San Diego campus using smartphones, and we uh, placed them in diverse indoor and outdoor scenes. So for example, this is a backpack that we took to a lecture hall. This is um, Center Hall, actually. And um, by diverse, I really do mean like diverse. So like, for example, this is a uh, oat that we placed in Price Center next to Burger King. Um, I thought it would be funny to put a CRT monitor on like the in the bathroom. <laughs> so yeah, this is a monitor in a bathroom, and this is a toaster uh, in grass. 
So like this really does, you know, test the uh, generalizability of um, neural network models. And finally, um, I thought I'd just give some uh, insight into what happens behind the scenes when you sort of uh, try to do real world data set collection at this scale with like hundreds of different objects. Um, so yeah, the, these are uh, some of the objects. We have objects just lying around everywhere in the lab. Um, we have buckets of like, so this is like a bucket of like 30 different shoes, 30 different bottles, like books, things like that. A lot of these objects we obtained from Amazon. So like on any given day, we would have like a shipment of like 20 toasters from Amazon or like, you know, you know, just random stuff from Amazon. And also a lot of the, these things were obtained from um, thrift stores and swap meets. Um, during development, we used like 15 drones because like in the beginning, like drones would crash a lot, thankfully. Um, these drones are relatively affordable. They're like $90 each, but you have to thank Professor Nuno for funding um, these drones. And um, so this is the drone flight space. So there's actually some engineering that went behind this, uh, but basically the drone would fly inside this enclosure and um, it would communicate to a computer out here, which would do all the, um, the computer vision algorithm um, processing uh, on the fly. And we also made an enclosure here so that this is actually the lab office. So we made an enclosure so that the drone wouldn't like fly out and like hit random people. So yeah, there was some engineering for the drone flight space itself. And, and that also entailed like about a hundred pounds of like bricks that were used to like assemble this thing. So, um, so yeah, that's sort of the part of the talk that I wanted to give about the data set collection and curation. And now I'm going to talk more about and how maybe um, maybe a few questions. Okay. Um, wait. So do you still have the bricks? <laughs> I actually might need to use some of the bricks. Um, I yeah, just bought them the from the Home Depot, but <laughs> yeah, maybe later I can borrow some bricks for you, from you. Um, yeah. yeah. So I'm just wondering, is there any like following up work on this thing, like? Um, um, you collected this data set, um, and then are, are there any following up work uh, using this data currently? Um, just yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I'm actually going to get into some research and experimental results that um, use this data set. I see. Uh, I yeah. see. And then like um, for the outdoor data sets, how many examples did you get to collect actually? Um, um, so it's like around 450. Uh, objects and so multiply that times eight because for each object we had eight different viewers. right right so uh you are connecting with foam right yeah uh did you get uh, rgbd or just rgb at that time uh so we we have 3d information from the cad models but we just use phones so there's no depth i see but right but just by the way right now iphone can take rgbd uh, like, yeah, but that's like the most high end iPhone. Right. So uh, like, maybe yeah, up yeah. to 12, some, 12 something. Well, we, we still have all the objects. Yeah, yeah, we could still add to the JSA. Well. We, we, right. we have all these objects, so we can do whatever we want to add right. to the data set. I, so I also recently collect some data just for the 60 post estimation kind of things. Uh, we, we kind of collaborate some some like Alibaba, this company, to get their objects and then ask them to just use the phone to take around, walk around the objects, take some videos. Um, I think we get around maybe 6,000 videos ish in total. Um, yeah, um, but, but just uh, it's also RGBD. So I think if, if you can continue doing this now, we can actually buy better phone and then have to that as well, so it can be quite useful. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the one of the reasons why we went into this, it's like, okay, you know, we have the objects and we keep sort of as more new tasks or whatever mm -hmm. appear. Then you know, uh, we can build on the sort of it's like a physical data set, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like you know, we can we can. Uh, Put the objects in rooms and and the, the, you know do look for I don't know yes, yes. understanding tasks we can I mean you know it's like there's there's um I mean actually the problem is like actually to 
store all these objects. So I have the department on my back. Because <laughs> uh, like always asking me to move things around. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, but uh, but it's uh, but I think it's a useful resource and certainly you know it can be you mm -hmm. know used to um, you know uh, uh, create other data sets right, right. or, or ex and, and also because you know there's already I mean there's already like this data on like for each object there's already like this all these data so now there's you know we uh, you know, like one can do other things and then like combine other data sets together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, you can go on. Okay. And also, and um, also these are, uh, and, and I think you mentioned that, but so these are all classes that are on ShapeNet and on, um, uh, you know, because that part of, part of the goal was also to look at like, you know, uh, domain adaptation for uh, trying to move shape and uh, shape understanding out of the, you know, digit the simulated domain and actually see if we can do something in the real world mm -hmm. rather than just relying on shape net. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Um, yeah. So, uh, uh, thank you. So, yeah. So that's sort of the um, data set side of things, the creation and curation. Um, Next, I'm going to talk about how we use that data for two key vision tasks. So first, um, image classification, and also for single view 3D reconstruction. And um, so uh, first, uh, we use 3D odds to evaluate classification robustness um, through under the context of adversarial attacks. So for some um, background information, um, these attacks are images which can be, which um, are minimally modified such that the CNNs fail dramatically um, when it comes to classifying them. And it's of great concern for many safety critical applications. So for example, um, you know, a classifier might classify this airplane um, correctly, but it was found that it's possible to modify the um, statistics of that image slightly. So for example, you can add some noise patterns or um, change the hue and things like that to make it be classified as an automobile or a frog or things like that. And this can be even be done in the real uh, 3D world. It was shown that you can like 3D print a turtle with special um, patterns on it, special texture, and it can be classified as like a rifle. So, um, so defenses um, in this literature generally uh, involve retraining the neural networks um, with these attacks. So what, what ends up happening is like you have a new attack that comes out uh, you can train it on some adversarial defenses, and then there's like a co-evolution where the attacks become a bit more sophisticated, and then the defense needs to handle it, and so on. So the main um, idea of this project was that we wanted to get some insight into computer vision versus human vision robustness. And um, usually in the literature, minimally modifying an example to make it adversarial is enforced with some like arbitrarily small threshold to try to make the attack imperceptible to the human eye. But in this work, we instead use human-based perception. So um, there were two uh, perception categories. So first is imperceptible and semantically imperceptible. So by imperceptible, we mean that it's sort of, um, in a literal sense, it's hard for a human to tell the difference between these two images from at the pixel level. So even though there might be slight differences, it's like hard to tell. And by semantically imperceptible, we mean that um, it's understood that the images in a literal sense might be different, but semantically, the core concept of the object depicted is still the same. So it's understood that this is still the same car, but just um, with different background and different viewpoint. So to get pairs like this, um, we use two different perturbation types. So uh, in particular, we use the OWL dataset to have, um, we use the camera shake and viewpoint variation as attacks to um, create pairs which are imperceptible or semantically imperceptible. And I'll talk a bit more about uh, the procedure to generate these pairs um, in a bit. But the key takeaway is that these um, attacks actually leverage like fundamental limitations of computer vision. So it's important to note that these attacks of like camera shake and viewpoint variation are easily produced by people, um, but they're hard to defend against because um, 
you know, currently there's no computer vision algorithm that faithfully can arbitrarily generate different viewpoints to train on in a realistic way, or nor can they create like realistic camera shakes, which um, truly follow the true statistics of like uh, actual camera shake. So um, the way we do this is through uh, like human trials and asking annotators um, this question. So um, this is uh, asking imperceptible. So here we show the annotators one image. We give them a distractor task. So we wait like around one second. We ask them to like count some green dots, wait a bit longer and ask them the question of, is this the same image as earlier? So, um, you know, if they answer yes, then we deem that this pair of images, we deem that as imperceptible. Um, and, you know, we can sort of tell that right now because the images are right next to each other, we can tell that at the pixel level, these images are not the same. Like this one has a bit more like detail. It's, the focus is a bit better. But the point of the distractor task is to sort of um, remove that like pixel level comparison and be able to evaluate just more generally, are they generally considered the same image? Um, this can be also be done uh, when you change the viewpoint. So for example, this um, Coca-Cola can has been uh, rotated a little bit, and we ask the Turker if these are the same images. And if they say yes, then we deem them imperceptible. Um, a similar procedure can be done, but um, asking if it's the same object as earlier rather than the same exact image as earlier. So in this case, um, I, uh, annotator might realize even after this distractor task that, you know, this is not the same image as I saw earlier. This is way more blurry. But um, they would also be able to recognize that intrinsically they're the same object. And so semantically, they're imperceptible. And the same can be done for um, viewpoint variation as well. So um, we, we went through, we got a bunch of pairs uh, from the uh, data set and we uh, went through and got annotations and we got a bunch of pairs of images. And we found that a lot of these pairs are actually, um, can be used as attacks for modern uh, neural networks. For example, um, sort of this pair of images here, even though they look imperceptible, um, actually 16 different classifiers are unable to um, classify them correctly. So it fools sort of 16 different classifiers that are uh, configured differently and have different architectures. Uh, similarly, for semantically imperceptible, so in terms of the uh, intrinsic objects, um, there are also a lot of examples that can be found where the neural network does not classify them correctly. Um, as a visualization, this is a heat map of like the different classes. So we found that certain classes are more vulnerable to attacks. So like things like telephones, books, and trains are a bit more vulnerable, whereas um, symmetric objects like bottles and lamps tend to be less vulnerable to um, these attacks. And finally, um, we also evaluated some basic ways to defend against these, these attacks. Um, so like things like uh, data augmentation and also some like adversarial defense uh, strategies in the literature we employed. And we found that compared to no defense, they didn't really help that much. Um, so, and this is the case both for camera shake and viewpoint variation. So in conclusion, um, I would say the main contribution of this work was um, discussing and proposing the new notion of adversarial attacks based on perception, and also showing that uh, many types of CNN models are vulnerable to these types of attacks. Uh, so I have a quick I have a quick question. So for the semantically in percent uh, attacks, how do you generate that? Um, oh, so we the, the way we generate that is just by asking a slightly different question. So we just ask if these, this image was depicts the same object as they saw earlier, instead of asking uh, if it's exactly the same image. Uh, this is done by human, right? Do you have a... Yeah. Uh, algorithm that can automatically generate the semantically imperceptible. So attacks. I mean, in principle, so first, yeah, we this was all done with annotators. In principle, you could train a network to like predict this. Um, but yeah, this was all in our data set. This is all manual annotation. Yeah. I see. So if you have this labeled pairs, maybe you can train a 
conditional GAN or something to automatically generate these things in future? Um, yeah, we can certainly do that. Um, the only addition I would say is that it's hard to guarantee that the, the, you know, the performance of GANs would be the same as like, you know, genuine data. But yeah, that's something that could be tried. Uh, yeah, certainly GANs may not be able to generate uh, realistic uh, attacks like this, but uh, suppose in a real scenario, it's unlikely that you are going to uh, to hire humans to generate attacks, right, all the time. Um, eventually, it is expected to have some automated algorithms to do this. I mean, mm -hmm. so, um, I, I would say that it's actually, um, the, 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 one of the points here is that these attacks, you don't need to be a machine learning person even. Uh, so anybody can generate an attack like this. You know, a two-year-old can generate an attack like this. All you have to do is to rotate the object uh, or, um, you know, shake it. Right. So, so, so the point here was, you know, we we spend a lot of time worrying about like, you know, the, the robustness of these neural networks to these adversarial attacks and so forth. But those are not the ones that actually are going to happen in the real world. These are like natural attacks. Uh, mm. You know, the neural networks are going to be under these attacks all the time. Mm. Uh, and and, yeah. and 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 so the, the I mean, uh, uh, part of the, the the idea here was to compare. I mean, people are subject to these attacks too, but they can deal with them. Mm. Uh, and not, not all, by the way. I mean, there were like, uh, there are cases where the same object, um, uh, maybe Brandon can talk a little bit about that, but there's like cases after a while you can't recognize, I mean, it, 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 there's two pictures of the same object and you can't say it's the same object. Uh, there mm. are li like lots of examples like that in the data set. But it's, you know, the robustness is, you know, uncomparably larger. Can you say anything about that, Brandon? Um, so, so do you mean two images being the same or? Yeah, like examples of images that are not, you know, that fail the semantically imperceptible test. So two, two images of the oh. same object, but, uh, you know, people can't realize it's the same object. Yeah, yeah. So I think that has to do with like uh, maybe hu human error. Mostly, no, but but uh, but you know, but they, uh, how how frequent is that? I mean, there's lots of examples in the data set. Where yeah, they, yeah. Were... yeah, yeah. So it was quite frequent, and I think that might be due to human error sometimes. But yeah, the details are in the paper. But it was frequent to where, you know, tests could be imperceptible but not semantically imperceptible. Yeah, I yeah I agree that this semantically uh, imperceptible imperceptible tests are more uh, interesting. I guess the technical challenge is how to generate these tests automatically. So in the, in the currently, currently widely studied uh, adver uh, adversarial perturbation uh, attacks, they can automate, automatically generate those tests by solving an optimization problem. And then for these semantically ones, uh, it's it seems more challenging to 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 generate those things automatically. Yeah, yeah but uh, it is a very uh, very great insight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, it is a bit. Yeah, this is more in the real world. Uh, it, it is a bit different than those um, specifically generated, engineered through optimization adversarial attacks. It's like a bit different uh, viewpoint on that. Um, so, uh, so the second, um, uh, second, uh, line of research that I want to discuss today is regarding, um, improving single view 3D reconstruction robustness through refinement. So this is another application of, um, the 3D odds data set that, um, I used, uh, for, for this purpose. And first I want to give some background for the task of single view 3D reconstruction. So here, um, you're given a 2D image of an object, and then the goal is to feed it to a neural network and recover its 3D shape. So this requires a neural network to kind of understand um, the underlying 3D geometry from this 2D image of a rabbit and be able to reconstruct it. 
And um, humans innately have this ability. So if, even if we see this rabbit, we can sort of imagine the 3D structure in our head. Um, even though it's easy for humans, however, this is kind of like a fundamental problem in 3D vision, uh, sort of the gap between 2D and 3D. And the reason why it's challenging is because it's actually like very under constrained. So for this given rabbit, um, you know, there are many different like ways to create a 3D version of it, such that at this viewpoint, it projects to this like silhouette, but like at different viewpoints, it looks incorrect. So the goal is, even though it is under constrained, uh, constrained, the goal is to still reconstruct a reasonable 3D shape. And some applications for this in, include uh, robotic grasping. So it's useful to have like the 3D geometry of the object that you want to grasp before doing so. Uh, it can be also be used for like AR and VR interactions or intera environment mapping for um, navigation in the th uh, 3D world. And um, in this literature of single view 3D reconstruction, there are some uh, current research issues. So the first is that the ideal data set is extremely difficult to obtain. Um, you can't really get a data set which is large, has real world 2D images and corresponding 3D ground truth of like the objects depicted in those images, like over many classes and different viewpoints, that's very hard to obtain. Um, and so therefore, um, currently methods usually rely on synthetic 3D data, which you can then, uh, like CAD models, which you can then uh, render in 2D uh, with, uh, with as many viewpoints or backgrounds or lighting conditions as you want. Additionally, um, even in like ideal synthetic settings, it's been found that fine grain details are hard to capture. So um, a hypothesis for the reason why is, you know, it's sort of a consequence of training on a large data set and sort of um, converging in local minima that do not generalize well and do not capture like fine grained details. For example, here, given this uh, image of a bird, um, we can see that the reconstruction uh, for the beak is not is like a bit too narrow. So it's not consistent with the input image. And same with um, sort of the tail part. And um, and this sort of indicates a memorization of like the class mean shape of a bird. So it's sort of just classifying that, oh yeah, I see a bird and just giving out a, a more average looking shape instead of a genuine geometric understanding that is consistent with the input image. So the idea behind um, uh, this uh, line of research is to reduce the domain gap, uh, even when it's trained on synthetic data and also be able to recover some of these lost details. Uh, so to do this, um, I proposed a novel uh, mesh refinement post-processing step. So the pipeline is as follows. Um, during deployment, you have some uh, input image, which you feed into some black box um, single view reconstruction uh, network. It'll output some 3D mesh, which is the general shape is there, but a lot of details might be missing. And then, um, and then the proposed uh, refinement step is this optimization here, which tries to recover some of these lost details. And, um, and all this uh, operates at test time. And um, even if this network is trained on synthetic data, the goal is if it's fed real data, um, normally it would lead to a lot of domain gaps and a lot of issues because it's not used to seeing real data. But um, the goal is for the refinement post-processing step to be able to recover a lot of these details um, nonetheless. And the main insight here is that um, given a bit of auxiliary information, can we recover these details and make the reconstructions better? And um, the way ref the refined neural network does this is um, it learns to deform the vertices of the original mesh reconstruction to make it better match the silhouette of the input image. So what the, how this works is, um, so you would feed this the image of this chair to the reconstruction method. You would have some like uh, coarse reconstruction that has some issues. And the goal is learn deformations on this mesh, so sort of stretch this triangular mesh, like move the vertices, such that um, the, re the refined mesh, when you render it and compare it to the input image's silhouette, it's consistent. Um, and we actually found that sort of um, naively doing this, uh, leads to a lot of degenerate solutions where 
Um, at this viewpoint, it looks fine, like it's consistent, but once you rotate it a little bit, it looks completely off. So um, there are a bunch of uh, regularization losses that um, I helped propose, and um, this helps uh, prevent the degenerate solutions. And I want to emphasize that all this happens at test time during deployment on the fly. So um, this architecture involves some, uh, like an encoder, and also some graph convolutions and some fully connected layers to learn those um, deformations from the vertex. And um, it takes around 400 iterations, like forward and backward passes, to optimize uh, these neural network weights. But in general, um, as you can see, like throughout optimization, the uh, original mesh becomes more, uh, more faithful to the original input image. And um, next, I just want to talk a bit about the losses that are used in a bit more detail. So um, first, uh, there's a silhouette loss, as I mentioned, and this is the main signal that is used to help um, guide the consistency of the refinements. There are also some standard losses um, that uh, help for smoothness. So these are used widely in the literature. Um, there are like Laplacian losses and normal consistency losses to make sure that the mesh is still um, quite smooth. Uh, smooth. Um, there's a displacement loss, which discourages overly large um, movements of the verte vertices and deformations. Um, there's also one loss, which is based on symmetry. So um, it uses the vertices of the mesh. So basically, that leaves you with like a point cloud. And for these reconstruction networks, uh, when they reconstruct the mesh, they're usually all aligned with each other, the outputs. So there's a plane of symmetry, which is um, generally fixed. And what that means is that um, for the point cloud of the mesh, you can take vertices here and like flip it across the plane of symmetry and compare it to the nearest neighbor vertex. And the goal is we want to minimize this distance um, to encourage more symmetry. And um, but there's all, it's also important to note that um, for many images, like it's like not all symmetric. So there might be some degree of asymmetry. So for example, the wing of this plane here. So additionally, symmetry confidence weights are learned per vertex, allowing some degree of asymmetry. So at a high level, the loss looks something like this. There's like an average over all the vertices in the point cloud. This is the nearest neighbor distance over all these points. Uh, this is a learned, um, a, a learned symmetry weight, which weighs this part. And then there's also a penalty here, um, which tries to discourage asymmetry as much as we can. And finally, um, this loss here uh, operates only on the vertices. So we also want symmetry when it comes to the faces of the mesh. So we do this through rendering. Um, so this encourages the render itself to be symmetric. So the way this works is we have one camera angle here. Uh, we render it at one camera angle. And we compare the horizontal flip of this render to the render of the, uh, of the camera flipped across the plane, the plane of symmetry. So it, at a high level, basically, um, the only way for these two images to be the same is if the object itself is symmetric about the plane of symmetry. And the loss looks something like this. You average over all the different cameras. It's like pixel wise. Um, we also use a, um, so since it's pixel wise, we need uh, the symmetry confidence weights to be per pixel. So this is done by a, a Barry-centric interpolation of those vertex weights so that we have like a symmetry texture map over the mesh. And um, this is, uh, these are some examples of some refinements. So um, this is the input image. This is the original mesh reconstruction. And as you can see, like after refinement, um, a lot of those parts and details are recovered. Um, same with this airplane here. Uh, like the whole uh, rear wing is able to be uh, reconstructed. Um, next, I want to talk a bit about some of these losses um, to give a bit more intuition. So um, suppose you have this input image and you have this uh, base reconstruction. So as you can see, a lot of the details are missing. If we try to just optimize uh, the silhouette loss, um, we can see that here the the silhouette is more faithful to the input image, but once you rotate a little bit, here the wing is like kind of messed up. 
So as we progressively add more losses like displacement, smoothness, and symmetry, it becomes, uh, it sort of regularizes this refinement process more and makes it more effective. Uh, this is just a uh, sort of bar plot of the performance of refine over different data sets. So um, like for shape, so here the orange bar is the reconstruction accuracy um, originally, and then the green is after refinement. So um, as you can see for a variety of different test data sets, um, even though the original reconstruction method is trained synthetically, um, it's able to generalize even to these um, these um, real data sets. And uh, Refine is able to provide significant gains in all cases. Um, next, um, so there are a bunch of like different, there's like probably hundreds of different single view reconstruction methods. I'm not going to go into detail on those, but basically refinement is able to uh, improve the results regardless of the reconstruction method. So we can just treat them as a black box and usually refinement will provide significant gains. So um, finally, I want to go over uh, refinement on the 3D odds data set. So as a reminder, um, there are three different domains and like eight different viewpoints per domain for 24 images total per object. So what we can do is we can actually feed each one of these 24 images to get a reconstructed 3D model of it. And that would be these orange dots here. And so we have a distribution and they each have different um, accuracies. So for example, like the dots uh, down here have lower uh, 3D accuracy, um, and then the dots here have better accuracy. So there's sort of a distribution here. We can then take each of these 24 uh, base reconstructions and refine them. And those are these green dots here. And we can see that in general, refining them um, increases the accuracy. And additionally, for many cases, it actually lowers the variance. So here we can see that the mean accuracy improves after refinement and also the standard deviation decreases, which means that um, it's sort of more consistent because ideally in principle, all these images should lead to the same, um, the same 3D reconstruction if that method is invariant. So uh, we did this for all the different objects in 3D odds and um, we found that on average, refine was able to improve the reconstruction accuracy while decreasing the standard deviation per object. Uh, we also have some results for um, evalu evaluating 3D odds reconstruction across the different factors, so different subsets of that data set. So for example, only looking at um, 180 degrees. So we can see this is ordered by uh, increasing accuracy. So we can see that like zero degrees and 180 tend to have lower performing results. Um, seems like they have issues with reconstructing images like directly from the front or from the back. Uh, we can see that uh, OWL tends to have lower performance than OWILD and OTURN, which kind of makes sense because OWL has a lot of noise due to the drone data collection, whereas OWILD uh, images are a bit cleaner and um, OTURN table images are like the most clean and have the most simple background, so it tends to have better performance. Also, we have some classes that perform better than others, like um, remotes and telephones um, networks uh, struggle with compared to cans and bottles. But the key takeaway here is that regardless of whatever split you want to look at or whatever subset you want to look at, um, compared to the original reconstruction accuracy, uh, refinement is able to improve results. So um, I just want to conclude today's talk by talking a bit about some future possible work. So um, a key um, theme of today's talk was generalizability and invariance in computer vision. And um, I believe that 3D odds can be a powerful and challenging benchmark to help accelerate and uh, track progress in this area. And there are some literatures of interest like domain adaptation, domain generalization, few shot learning, and metric learning. Um, it can be also be used for other tasks. So while I focused on classification and 3D reconstruction, um, 3D odds could be tested on retrieval, segmentation, novel view synthesis, etc. And finally, there are some, uh, you know, this might, uh, you know, open the door to other future hierarchical data sets. 
So um, to my knowledge, this is the first data set of its kind, which is truly hierarchical in the real world. So in the future, um, it might be interesting to investigate expanding the number of objects and um, incorporating more fine-grained and precise levels of variation. For example, different lighting conditions or more uh, camera viewpoints. Uh, yeah, so this is just a list of uh, publications that I've been a part of. And um, finally, I just want to note that uh, the 3D Odds project is the result of uh, years of effort from a lot of different collaborators besides myself. So um, all their uh, names are listed here. And um, many of my teammates are actually here watching right now. So I just want to say thank you for your help. I'm happy to be able to present like all of our combined efforts. And like it was an honor to work with everyone. And um, yeah, the collaboration made the project really fun and enjoyable for me. So yeah, once again, thank you. And that concludes my talk. OK. OK, so uh, we can have some uh, questions from the audience now, or, or from the panel if you have any questions that are now. You know, I mean, we'll have a private uh, session with him, but. Um, any uh, yeah, thanks. thanks for the nice talk. Uh, so can you go back, uh, go uh, two slides back? Uh -huh. uh, maybe yes, maybe three. So there was uh, there was some result showing the um, so in the errors on individual classes. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, this one. so for this one, uh, is there a pattern that uh, so on certain classes, it works uh, not uh, uh, not as good as other classes. So what, what, what might be the reason behind that? For example, for remote and the telephone, uh, why it works worse than the other classes? Is there any uh, patterns behind this? Mm -hmm. So um, are you talking about the reconstruction accuracy or are you talking about the gain after refinement? Um, I mean the reconstruction. So for your method, right, after the, actually for both, either the original or after the refinement, mm -hmm. so the app score uh, is worse on remote and telephone compared with on can and bottle. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. what might be the reason behind this? So um, there might be several factors. First of all, uh, the trained reconstruction methods um, ShapeNet does not have it, so it's like trained on ShapeNet, and ShapeNet for some classes has less data than others. So for example, actually remote is not even, it has an asterisk, and that's, uh, that means that remote is not actually one of the classes in ShapeNet. So I'm, I'm like testing it on remote, even though it's not a class on ShapeNet. And mm -hmm. um, for, for example, like telephone here, um, telephone, there's like not that many examples uh, not a lot of data from ShapeNet compared to a car. If there are like tens of thousands of cars, but maybe only a few hundred or a few thousand telephones. Mm -hmm. And yes. and also these classes might be more challenging in general. Like there's like telephones can be kind of like complicated versus a car is generally, you know, the shape is somewhat simple. Mm -hmm. I see. So in the data set, uh, for the frequency of the different classes, uh, is that distributed the uh, unevenly or roughly, uh, roughly uh, evenly. So ShapeNet, I believe, does have a long tail. So some classes are like cars and stuff are more prevalent than other classes. So maybe maybe you should maybe you should say that. So, so he's starting from a network. So he's not draining the ShapeNet network. So he's start, you're starting from a network that is uh, available, right? Mm -hmm. Or are you training the ShapeNet network? I'm just using a pre-trained network on ShapeNet. And, and the network is trained over all classes, right? Over shapes of all yes. classes? Yes. OK. Yes. So, I th so that's where the data might have a, you know, a, a, an effect uh, in the sense that the network originally is already better at some classes than others. Um, maybe probably a combination of the, 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 the object being harder and the data being more or less. OK, thanks. So uh, maybe just a small question. When you are doing the reconstruction, is the, the pose given, um, the camera pose given? Uh -huh. 
Ciao. Um, uh, so for this reconstruction to get the original mesh, the camera pose is not given. Mm -hmm. However, to do the refinement, we use a bit of auxiliary information. So mm -hmm. that includes the silhouette and the camera pose. I see. Yes. yes. OK. OK. So, so for the initial estimation, it's just given the image and then request like like and then get the shape in the canonical pose, right? Like whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. Okay, got it. Yes. Maybe you should uh, uh, ask the audience if there's no uh, comments from the audience. Maybe then um, um, you know it's time for the committee to because uh, the committee is already asking questions. <laughs> Uh, I just have some very basic, mm -hmm. kind of not questions, but I, I feel like, so I think it's very cool that you're basically proposing the whole thing, like using test time training, which means from what I understand, you don't even need to train on any additional data. Mm -hmm. But I, I think you're like the data set is cool enough that maybe you can somehow combine that with the large scale pre-training on synthetic data sets. So, basically use your data set as an unbiased kind of validation data to kind of calibrate these large models, which themselves can be biased. So. I see, so incorporate some data in this refinement process. Yeah, I, I guess it's not even just this particular project, but rather how to combine our kind of lab collected data, which might not be as scalable as um, like shape net or model net. And so combine these kind of curated data with large scale pre-training to, with the yeah. goal of kind of um, debiasing these large scale models. Yeah, it's uh, kind I, of just a general suggestion. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting point. So yeah, we are only using 3D odds as a test test set or benchmark right now. So it would yeah. be interesting if you can use a small amount of this data in a way that's profitable, um, like acknowledging that you won't be able to have a ton of this data, but use a small amount. I agree that could be interesting. Uh, hi, Brandon. Uh, I just curious mm -hmm. that uh, since all that your shows are uh, for only one single object on an image. Uh, did you try multi-object on image or is there any work working on that? Uh, reconstruction work. So multiple images or multiple objects? Uh, multiple objects. Uh, so refining multiple objects jointly? Uh, yes. Um, so refinement itself is a new paradigm that I propose in this paper. So I'm fairly confident that there's no work on that. Uh, uh, but I think- What about for, only for the reconstruction? So what would be the inputs? The inputs would be one image. Uh, for example, one, one image uh, has uh, like a two or three objects. Oh, I see. So reconstructing a scene. Uh, yes. Kind of. Oh, OK. Um, yeah, I think it could be possible to generalize this refinement to scenes um, of objects. You, instead of a silhouette, maybe you would have a segmentation map or something like that. And you could generalize it to have multiple uh, objects in the scene and do a refinement. Yeah. Uh, so what do you think, what, what, uh, do you think what's uh, the difficulties to, uh, to transfer the, the work on a single object to multiple objects? So, I mean, it would be easy. So one, the most basic approach would be just to treat those multiple objects individually and ref just, you know, just like refine them individually. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any gain to be doing it jointly. Um, there may be some gains, but yeah, off the top of my head, I, I don't think it would be too difficult to do this, to extend it to multiple objects. Okay, okay thank you. Hi, Brandon. Um, may I ask a quick question? So yeah. just in terms of the figure um, on this slide, 
So how, since you can only see like uh, one view of the object, so how do you assign these features to all of the vertices? Uh, I see. So um, yeah, so this is an encoder uh, that, where you get a feature map. And this is just, so basically we project, so um, at a certain viewpoint, there's like a ray, right? And we assign all those vertices in that ray to the same feature. I see. So even for those uh, occluded ones. Yeah, yeah. So that could be an area of improvement. Um, since this is sort of just the preliminary work. Right. Uh, yeah, I just take that uh, sort of more basic approach. I see. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Mm -hmm. Okay, any, any more questions from the audience? If not, then um, we can uh, sort of now move on to the period with just the committee. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to, uh, you know, leave the meeting if you're not part of the committee or Brandon. Okay, so Brandon, maybe you should stop recording now. Okay. Um,